a six-time Pro Bowl selection. He was a five-time first-team All-Pro, a member of the NFL's All-Decade team in the 70s, Carl Eller, and he's also a Pro Football Hall of Famer. How are you doing, Carl? Carl? Yes. How are you doing today? I am good. Yourself? Great. Carl, you have made news the last couple of years with fighting for the rights of the retired players. You filed the lawsuit against the NFL, basically saying, we want to be in there during the negotiating sessions. We've talked to multiple former Hall of Famers and players, and they don't know what they got as part of this settlement. Well, I'll tell you, uh, there were some improvements. There were many improvements, and there were some consolidations of some plans. Uh, but the uh, big benefit to what uh, most guys that are in our position uh, is the uh, legacy fund. And uh, although the numbers are there, it hasn't been decided how it's going to be distributed or how it's going to be divided up. So uh, that's uh, going to the Players Association now. Uh, I met with a group of retirees in the NFL office, and we made recommendations as to how those funds should be uh, divided among the pre-93ers, and that's exclusively how it will be divided. Uh, although guys that are on both sides, 93 and 90 and, and beyond, uh, they'll get for their portions of 93 and, 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 and prior, they'll get that, but that will not include the years after that. Is there any entity that's out there looking out for the welfare of the retired players as much as you think there should be? Well, that's pretty much the role that uh, that I play and that we play. Uh, I'm the president of the Retired Players Association, and that was our big uh, effort and our big push, as you said, to be there to represent the retired players during the negotiations. And uh, and because we think that the retired players do need a voice and do need someone uh, uh, that's there to to represent them in all phases of the negotiations. Two former Hall of Famers we talked to, Ron Mix and Joe DeMalure, who took their pensions at 45 at a greatly reduced amount. Guys like that, are their pension benefits going to increase, or since they took them early, it's too bad? They're out of luck. Well, they will get the increases, but it will still be according to that formula uh, that they uh, used uh, when, when they took it. Uh, you know, they, they will get an increase, and it will be prorated based on that. But uh, they will definitely get an increase, in, and, and it's going to mean a lot, particularly to those guys that took their pension early, because those amounts that they receive now are very, very small, and, uh, and, and that's where most, most guys were, were misguided. You, you know, when we think of the, uh, uh, the Players Association, this was advice that was handed out and certainly condoned by the Players Association. Even though we're going back uh, quite a few years, uh, I think that, that an organization that represents you should not give you bad advice. I mean, I think that they should be in a position to at least instruct you what the consequences are should you make, which is that, uh, in this case, is a very poor decision. Uh, they can't stop you, but they should inform you. And, and I think this is where just one area where the Players Association has failed the retired players. Why, why did it happen that way? I mean, once you're well, out of the league, do they just not care? Well, 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 well. The thing is, is, is that uh, you know, there's a lot of information that goes into the uh, into the life uh, or or trying to uh, situate the retired player because for the uh, athlete that plays in the National Football League, their retirement comes early, a very premature retirement. You know, by the age of uh, 30 or certainly by the mid-30s, their, their career is over. So you're talking about a long time in retirement. And, and, and when I played, it wasn't going from football to retirement. You went to a second career. Uh, so you had to plan for that and prepare for that. But, but the idea is that your primary career is over at a very, very young age. And you have to sustain yourself for an extremely long amount of time and that includes health care, that includes, you know, finances or pensions and all those things. So those decisions are very, very complicated, and the Players Association was just not prepared or equipped to make those decisions at that time. And, and my feeling is, is I don't think that they have improved their capabilities. Uh, whether they care, it seems as if they don't or is that their priorities are focused on the on the current players, that's where their actions indicate. You know, I, I, I still believe that 
they know that they're going to be there someday. I find it hard to believe that they just don't care. Given the brevity of NFL careers, wouldn't it make sense for the pension, uh, the full ve- the full vesting of the pension, to kick in at an earlier age than say sixty five? Make it fifty five or fifty or something like that. Well, it does kick in. That's a normal return to an age at fifty five. As you mentioned, some guys had the option and took that option of taking it early at forty five. And when you do that, there is a penalty, you know, because it's based on a normal retirement age in the NFL of of 55. Where for most people, you know, now Social Security is going on up from 62 to, you know, 65 and even older. But uh, you can take it at 55. That's how it was actuated. And so, you know, if a guy takes it then, he can leave it in there long, and, of course, it increases just the opposite of if you take it early. You get more benefits if you leave it in. Unfortunately, only a few, few players were able to do that. And I think, uh, you know, when you talk about the Hall of Fame, uh, there were probably only about 4% of the players that was actually able to leave their pensions in and then take it, uh, take it later. And uh, fortunately, I'm one of those guys that just, by sheer determination, waited. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it's quite a difference between those guys that, that are on my end and those guys that, that, that took it early. I know a lot of the former players cannot stand Gene Upshaw. They blame him for a lot of the problems, saying, you know what, this guy sold us out. He was making $12 million a year, and you know what, he didn't care about us. Well, it's true, and, and, and I know, and, and they have some legal things that they hide behind, but, you know, I feel, and, and it sounds as if, uh, you know, I know many people in the listening audience, we felt like Gene was one of us. I mean, there, there is a legal uh, uh, ramification, and then there's the spirit of the law. We don't think that Gene followed the spirit of the spirit, at least uh, from a player to player, at all. He, he was just the opposite. I don't think, and I know this is a feeling of many players that he really cared about us or represented us, and uh, and I think we were harmed because of that. Uh, you know. Um, And it came as a surprise to most players, certainly to me. You know, I played against Gene. We, our careers almost parallel each other. Uh, I just cannot see him being in the position and doing the things that he did. It just doesn't make sense. And that hurt a lot of players. I personally was hurt by that. I felt betrayed. You know, I I just thought that uh, he was certainly the wrong man. And the and the players association were just the, the wrong organization to, to to lead the retired players. Okay. Speaking of surprises, how surprising is it that it seems like as if the NFL has just discovered there's a problem with concussions? I, I would think that's been going on ever since the first helmet got put on somebody's head and they played football. Well, well, well I certainly I, I I certainly don't 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 see that they. Uh, really took a real, uh, a, you know, uh, deep look into it. I don't think that they were, you know, curious to find out that whether they knew or not. I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I would find it hard to believe that they didn't uh, have some indication that the, the kind of contact that the NFL uh, brings about would not cause, uh, you know, some kind of uh, lethal damage. So, uh yeah, that, that, that is a little surprising that they would, uh, you know. And, and they're softening that, too, a little bit. I mean, you know, it, 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 you know, you got fans that are intelligent people. You know, certainly the players have, uh, you know, gained some intelligence to the point where that doesn't make sense that they didn't know or, or could not have taken precautions in, in the past. Did you ever confront Gene Upshaw and say, you know what, what are you doing, Gene? You're one of us. Well, you know, I really did not have a chance to do that except maybe on one occasion or something at a meeting, something, but not not really. Uh, I didn't really have the opportunity. By the time we, he exposed himself, you know, it was very, very late in the game. And, of course, uh, unfortunately, you know, he ended up passing away not, not long after that. 
But, you know, this came about as a result of the needs of the retired players. They began to put the heat on Gene. They began to put the heat on the players' associations. Like, hey, what are you doing for us? I mean, we got these guys out here. And uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, these things are just now, be- well, not just now, but they're beginning to show up in in, 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 in bunches, you know. I mean, there are guys that are my age and younger even are suffering from these kinds of injuries and these kinds of consequences, including the brain trauma and the head injuries, all of those things, we're just beginning to to, 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 to realize the consequences of our, you know, of our playing days. And, and so now these claims are coming forward. But, you know, Gene just, uh, just, did not did not represent us at all, and and I don't think it phased him at all because he was earning the income from the current guys, and he was plenty happy just to, just to get that, you know. So he didn't really have a need to to care about us, and and it's unfortunate that he he took that route. Do you think players come into the league with a little greater awareness and understanding of of some of these problems? When you came out of Minnesota to play for the Vikings, I'm sure pensions and things like that didn't cross your mind. Well, you know, I mean, these stories go, uh, you know, back and forth, and they've been around for a long time. You realize you've got a short career. The problem is finding the, the, the proper guidance, you know, and if you don't have that in your family or have a trusted friend or coach or comrade or something, you're pretty much on your own. And what happens is that uh, players become victims. I mean, they're prey to the guys that are out there, and, and um, 90 some percent of them get really bad advice because now, you know, somebody comes up, they see this young guy, he's got all this money, and they know he doesn't know what to do with it because he's never had it before. And, and so they befriend this guy, and, and uh, the, you know, the player doesn't have any indication whether this guy is a straight uh, guy, upright guy or not. And, and uh, they play these tricks, you know, be nice to him and, and all of that. And, and by, by the time his career is over, as you mentioned, it's just a few short years before that, that career is over. And, and then it's not long after that money is gone, and, and then all the friends are gone. But they certainly are there while the money's coming in. But, you know, you're on your own to, to fend for yourself. So uh, I think that's a big problem. You were at Minnesota with another NFL Hall of Famer, Bobby Bell. How did anyone get by your defense with you on the line and Bell a linebacker? Uh, no one did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bobby was a great player. Those were great Minnesota years. And, then you know, we go back, we're talking many. I'm not even going to mention that number because it goes back to, you know, days of, um, you know, uh, the, the great North Woods being uh, discovered up here. But, yeah, those were great, great, those were great uh, years. Uh, Bobby was a great teammate. Uh, they were national champions uh, uh, the one year, uh, you know, Big Ten champions uh, uh, the next year. And uh, this year, our leader, uh, Sandy Stevens, who was a pioneer in quarterback, one of the first African-Americans to quarterback or uh, be an All-American at quarterback, is going into the College Football Hall of Fame. So that's a big honor. We're all happy about that. But, but those were great, great teams. Never lost to Michigan, so, you know, those are, you know, timing is everything. It was at the right place at the right time. So which team is causing you more agony this season, your Gophers or your Vikings? Oh, oh man. <laughs> I'm I'm watching the Lynx play. We're, we're thinking all of them. <laughs> it's gotten that desperate, huh? It's gotten that desperate. We, we are totally desperate here this year, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, the the guys are letting us down, so we're getting behind the women. Maybe Bud Grant will come out of retirement and lead the Vikings again. Yeah, they mentioned my name, too, in that category. Uh, but uh, Bud says hang in there, and what else can you do? I guess. Do, do they want you to coach or play? Oh, well, I don't know if I can do either very well. <laughs> they're, they're, they're looking for help, I can tell you that. When you were on that line, I mean, you guys were loaded. You, Jim Marshall, yeah. Alan Page, I mean, the Purple People leaders. What made you so good? Was it your talent, or was it? I wasn't Buddy Ryan your defensive coordinator, your line coach then. Yeah, but Buddy Ryan was uh, our coach part of the time. We had uh, Jack Patera there too for a number of those years, 
Uh, so they, they kind of uh, combined there for a number of those years. But, you know, we started out with somebody totally different there. It was, uh, again, uh, the timing. You know, we had great talent. You know, you have Alan Page and Jim Marshall and Gary Larson. And, you know, I, I just think it was a combination. But it was, a, it was a good chemistry. We all really cared about each other, supported each other, and, and just took great pride in and 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 being uh you know the, the the kinds of players we were and part of the team that we were part of who was the best running back you went up against well it, it's very difficult i played against some of the great ones jim brown gail spears oj simpson uh walter payton all of those guys are all they're all different uh I like to point uh, my favorite. I won't say he's my favorite, but I, I I think that Gail Sears was the most was the biggest threat because you know he could score from anywhere on the field at any point. Any time he had the ball in his hands, he was he was liable to end up with six points on the board. And he was extremely quick for for a defensive lineman. You know you. Uh, you, you watch these guys, uh, they take a long time to get up to the line uh, today and they can pick the holes. But Gail says he would be at the line as soon as you made contact with the interior lineman. And if you didn't stop him there, he was gone. We got a video going. We are do a video podcast. We got a picture of you launching trying to catch Gail Sayers. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, good luck. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I can catch him now. Uh, I don't know. He's bus, still in pretty good shape. Or the, or, or the airport or something. Maybe I can catch him. Yeah, uh, wasn't catch, it, him for, catch him for lunch or something, but not on the football field. Wasn't it O.J. Simpson who ran through the airport? Yeah, that was O.J. that ran through <laughs> Go, the airport. <laughs> For people who don't remember Gail Sayers, he he was like a taller, sleeker, smoother, more greyhound-like Barry Sanders. He could cut on a dime and accelerate incredibly. Yeah, yeah, he was an incredible, incredible running back. You were in numerous Super Bowls. Did you ever think, you know what, if we did something different, we could have won a couple of those Super Bowls? Well, yeah, yeah, we we were very close. We were very competitive. I mean, we played some great teams, some of the really great all-time teams. Uh, the Kansas City team was a team that was loaded. Uh, we played the Steelers team, which might have been the best Steelers team ever, you know, with uh, Franco, Len Swan, uh, all of those guys, the Bradshaw, you know, and uh, Joe Green. Oh, man. The stalwart. I mean, they they just had a great, uh, they just had a great, great, great team there. Well balanced team. Uh, so I that might have been the, uh, one of the better teams. And then we played Miami, who was that undefeated team with Zonka and Kick and Greasy and Fleming, all those guys. I mean, you know, we played great teams. And even the Oakland team, we played. I thought we were closer and. Uh, we we really had a chance to to beat Oakland. Uh, they, they were a team. I, I I think of the four, we certainly had a chance. But I don't think that was our best Super Bowl team. Our best Super Bowl team was probably between the Pittsburgh and the Miami. I wish Miami you would have beat. I wish you would have beat that Miami team because it would have shut them up. I'm tired of hearing about they're the only undefeated team, especially Mercury Morris. I know. I know. I know. I know. But. Um, and they had a lot of weapons, and you know, it just uh, I, I just can't explain it. Certainly, would have been something that would have made uh, made my career just uh, you know just just uh, fantastic icing on the cake. Who was the toughest offensive lineman you had to go up against? Uh, then I, when I'm asked that question, I generally refer to a guy Bob Brown, who uh, actually went into the Hall of Fame at the same time. Uh, Bob must have been put on this earth to just really uh, be my nemesis because, you know, he was at Bra Nebraska when I was at the University of Minnesota. We actually have the same age and the same graduating class. So I, I never could shake him. I could never get rid of him. But, and, uh, and, man, when he showed up on our schedule, you know, I, I, I spent extra time in the locker room and the, tra the training room, uh, you know, getting ready for him. So, um uh, he, he was great. The, the thing that was great about Bob was that he had a different character. He wasn't just satisfied with protecting the quarterback. 
he wanted to annihilate the defensive end. So you had to be on guard all the time. And I want to commend you for your work now as a licensed drug and alcohol counselor trying to get people straight because not too many former players really care about the community. Well, you know, I, I've been very fortunate. I'm just thinking here. we got a great day here in Minnesota. I'm actually sitting outside. It's, it's very pleasant. I've, I, I, I'm at a point now where I realize so many good things happen to me as, as an athlete, as a football player, and as a person. And I'm just really happy wherever I can give back or whenever I can give back. I'm, I'm just, uh, just, just really a, a happy person. So I thank you for, for saying that. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Howard. It's a pleasure talking to you. My pleasure talking to you. Thank you.